In this lesson, we'll begin our discussion on tissues. We know that tissues in the levels of organization are the third level up. Right? Remember, it begins with chemicals or the molecular layer. This is where we have all the different chemicals that make us up water proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, DNA, RNA, right? all these chemicals come together to form the next level of organization which is the cellular layer. Cells then come together to form what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of lessons is going to be our tissues. So here's a diagram representing that where we have up here the cells. Right? Cells come together they're going to combine to form tissues and we're going to see in a moment there are four principal tissue types or four main tissue types epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue and nervous tissue. In this lesson we're just going to kind of overview them um, and then look at them in greater detail as we uh, go through the next couple lessons. These four tissue types now combine to form our organs, right? Most organs have at least two tissue types, things like the heart. Here's a gland, the thyroid gland, the brain, the kidneys, the stomach, the liver, that type of thing. And then the organs, they come together as a review to form our organ systems, right? Remember we have 11 organ systems, then these 11 organ systems come together to form the organism. So if we were going to define what a tissue is, very simply we can say it's a collection of specialized cells that perform specific functions, right? So the function of the specialized cells are going to determine the function of the tissue. And as we saw in the previous slide uh, on the um, the diagram that tissues in combination are going to form organs such as the heart, the stomach, the liver, that type of thing. Right? Some, some organs only have a few tissue types, um, others have all four tissue types. Okay? Um, and then the study of tissues is known as histology. Right? If you remember from previous lessons that the study of cells was cytology, histology is the study of tissues. So. I do need you to know there are four principal tissue types. Over the next couple lessons, we're going to look at them in great detail. They are um, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. All right, so again, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Right? The four principal tissue types, four main tissue types. This is from another book just kind of showing epithelial tissue here. Here's some connective tissue, muscle tissue, and then this is a neuron that makes up nervous tissue. So let's do a little um, just overview. The next two slides are just kind of like an overview of the, uh, the four tissue types. And then again, over the next couple lessons, we're going to get into it in much more detail. Highlight these two words here. Epithelial tissue is going to cover and line. Right? Whenever I hear epithelial tissue, I think covering and lining. It covers exposed surfaces. Right? So even things like your skin right here, if you were to touch like this right now, um, you're touching epithelium. It lines internal passageways, hollow organs, blood vessels, uh, even even uh, cavities on the inside, uh, we'll, we'll see. And then one other thing that epithelial tissue do, does is it forms our glands, right? Just different um, uh, glands that produce different chemicals or different substances. Connective tissue, on the other hand, uh, has a bunch of different functions. It can act as a, a way of like a packing material almost where it fills internal spaces. It can act as a support tissue where things like cartilage and bone are type of types of connective tissue. It can do transport um, as an example of that. Blood and lymph transport substances throughout the body. Right? Think about blood transports oxygen. It transports nutrients, transports hormones and waste products, that type of thing. Connective, um, the other last thing that connective tissue does is it uh, can help to store energy. This would be an example of adipose tissue, which is fat. Right? Fat is actually a long term uh, storage for us. 
Muscle tissue is specialized for contraction. Uh, we have uh, three different types of muscle tissue. We have skeletal muscle, right? Just any movements that I'm doing right now or that you may be doing if you're writing or highlighting is coming from skeletal muscle. Heart muscle is also known as cardiac muscle. That's going to contract the heart and move the blood around. And then smooth muscle we find in the walls of our hollow organs. And if you even want to add to that um, over here and blood vessels, right? So that uh, all the uh, uh, walls of these organs and the blood vessels have smooth muscle in them. Finally, the last type of um, tissue is going to be nervous tissue. Uh, think of nervous tissue as a controlled uh, tissue. It's basically carrying electrical impulses from one part of the body to another to control that part of the body. Okay, so those was just, the, just some introductory remarks uh, regarding um, connective tissue. Let's take a look at epithelial tissue. We'll, we'll begin looking at epithelial tissue. So epithelial tissue includes epithelia, which is basically layers of cells. And just note here, you can say epithelium is singular. Um, so it's going to have layers of cells. Uh, these cells are going to do two things. They're going to, like I said before, they're going to cover and line. Think of them as lining all of our internal surfaces. Any system that has openings to the outside world are going to be completely lined by epithelium. What would that be? Respiratory system, digestive system, urinary system, reproductive system. All of these systems are open to the outside world. They're going to have um, uh, epithelium lining or epithelia lining the entire system. They line our internal body cavities, things like the pleural cavities the pericardial cavity, the peritoneal or the abdominal pelvic cavity is all lined by epithelium. And then it also lines our blood vessels. You know, even if you want to add here, blood vessels and heart, they're kind of continuous. The blood vessels lead to the heart. That's all kind of continuous uh, structures. That is all lined by um, epithelium. And then we said that epithelia also does covering, right? It's going to cover external surfaces. Prime example is the skin. Like I said, if you just go like this, right now you are touching epithelium. The other thing that epithelial tissue includes is glands, right? These are structures that produce fluid secretions. We're going to th see things without getting too detailed now, like things like sweat glands, oil glands, endocrine glands, right? Hormones that come from your thyroid, your pancreas, that type of thing. Right? All of that is going to be glandular tissue. Okay. The next couple slides are important. These are actually function slides. What are some of the functions of epithelium? Number one, since it's doing covering and lining, it is a physical protector. It provides physical protection. Right? It protects surfaces from abrasion. Right? Think about your skin. Right? All day long, things are rubbing against you. But if we didn't have epithelium there, we would just have no protection. We wouldn't have any more skin and we would die. It also prevents dehydration, right? The fact that we have all this epithelium on our skin is actually keeping moisture on the inside. And it protects from any type of damaging, you know, irritant or chemical agent. So that's an important function, physical protection. Another uh, function, right, since epithelium is covering and lining, um, it does control what moves in and out of the body, right? So substances must move through epithelium to either get into the body or into the, uh, you know, into an organ or um, out, either, either way. We call that permeability, right? And we're going to take a look at that in great detail, how um, substances move in and, in and out through epithelium. All right, so it controls permeability. Physical protection controls permeability. Third one's an important one too. It provides sensation. It turns out epithelia have a, gr a great nerve supply, right? meaning that they have a lot of uh, structures from the nervous system going to the epithelium, and that's going to provide sensation or you know, a, a way of uh, providing information to the brain and spinal cord as far as what's happening in the outside world, if it's coming from the skin, or even if it's coming from an organ. Right? So epithelial 
epithelia, excuse me, are sensitive to stimulation. And again, the reason for that is they have a good nerve supply, and I'll show you that. And that's basically providing information to the nervous system about any changes in our internal environment or the external environment. And then this uh, function here we kind of mentioned already is that epithelium does form our glands, right? Epithelia produces our uh, glands, right? So glands are cells that produce secretions, right? They can be for protection, right? Um, these are secretions that are char discharged onto the surface of the epithelium. Um, if you think about um, maybe oil that comes from our skin, right, it's going to help to uh, protect us. It helps to keep the skin um, kind of uh, moist and um, not, you know, from not drying out and cracking, that type of thing. And there's even chemicals and oil that actually help to suppress bacterial growth. And then um, sometimes glands will produce chemical messaging. This is hormones that are secreted into the bloodstream, right? So when we are glands from our thyroid gland, or hormones from our thyroid gland are released, right? They're coming from epithelial cells in the thyroid. Okay, so those are the main functions that I'd like you to know. Let's take a look at some characteristics of epithelia. Number one is something known as polarity. And all we're saying here is that an epithelial cell has an apical and a basal and lateral surface. Apical means this, it's the part of the cell that's going to be at the top. Right? This is the exposed surface of the epithelial cell. Before I go with microvilli and cilia, let's go to this picture here. So basically here we're seeing two epithelial cells. Okay, This top part here is the apical surface. At the bottom is the basal surface. And then the sides over here like this would be the lateral surface. Right? So apical up top, let me follow my cursor right there. Basal down over here. And then lateral right there. Now, many times, not all the time, but many times on the apical surface, there may be some structures. For instance, microvilli are folds in the cell membrane that uh, increase surface area and allow for uh, better absorption. So microvilli increase absorption. Some other cells may have cilia, right? and the um, cilia help to move substances across the cell. So here, these are more like hair-like projections that go, that go up. Uh, let's just say some debris or some fluid got near the cilia. The cilia would start to beat. right? They would start to move in unison and move substances along the cell. Right? So both microvilli um, and cilia are located on the top apical surface. The basal lateral surface, very simple, basal surface is going to be at the bottom, and then the lateral surface is obviously going to be on the side. Okay, so that's from one textbook. Put some, just another textbook, just to give you a little bit of an idea here. So here they're showing you the apical surface on the top, basal surface on the bottom, and then the lateral surfaces. This, I like this picture too. Um, here you can see this is a neuron or nerve coming to the epithelial. So any changes that take place here, the nerve impulses are going to go right through that nerve back to the brain or the spinal cord to figure out what's going on. But we'll, we'll talk more about that later. All right? So this is just basically apical surface, basal surface, lateral surface. Okay, so that's what we call polarity. Another uh, characteristic of epithelial that I'd like you to know is cellularity. This is wh um, where cells uh, that are epithelial cells are joined together and they actually form sheets of cells. And you know this already. Think about this, right? Maybe a time you've had a sunburn, right? Sun beats down on your shoulder. A couple of days later, you look at your shoulder and you see that the skin is starting to peel. And you can peel off the skin in like sheets. The reason that is, is all the cells are connected together. These are epithelial cells that are joined together. If they weren't connected, the cells would just kind of flake off individually, right? You wouldn't be able to pull off your skin in a sheet, right? So epithelia are sheets of cells held together by cell junctions. And I'll go over that with you also in, um, in the very near future. All right, so that's called cellularity. 
Attachment is where the base of the epithelial cell are attached to a substance known as the basement membrane. It's basically keeping the epithelial cell uh, connected to our body, otherwise the cells would lift away. Actually, if I go back a picture for a moment, here you can see, see this blue thing here and here? Both of these structures make up the basement membrane. So attachment is just how these cells here are attached to the basement membrane. Right, cellularity is where they're attached more side to side. Okay, a couple other um, characteristics of epithelium. Um, epithelium is avascular. A, the prefix here, A means without, and vascular means blood vessels, right? So they lack blood vessels. We'll get into this in subsequent lessons, but if I go back to this picture here for a minute, um, even though these are live, you know, living cells, they don't have a direct blood supply, they are going to need like oxygen, they need to get rid of carbon dioxide, they're going to need glucose, so where do they get that stuff from? They're actually going to get it from the connective tissue below, so here they're actually showing a blood vessel, so things like oxygen would diffuse up into the cell. Carbon dioxide would diffuse down into the bloodstream and so on and so forth. Right? Now, you know, nutrients diffuse up, waste products diffuse down. So even though these are live cells and they don't have a blood supply, they do get their nutrients and get rid of waste products from blood vessels that are in the neighborhood, they're close by. Right, we'll get into that also. Okay. The last uh, characteristic of epithelia that I'd like you to know is called regeneration. All right, think about this. Our epithelia are you know, facing the outside world if it's the skin, or they're facing you know, the inside of your intestines um, for digestion where there's you know, different chemicals and enzymes. Um, these, these cells will be sloughed away, right? Like this, if I just go like this, I'm sloughing away cells. We need to replace them, all right? So it turns out that epithelial cells are continually being replaced. Any ones that are lost or damaged are being replaced. Near the basement membrane, we have these stem cells that continually divide, right? They're constantly undergoing mitosis and replacing epithelial cells, right? So it turns out the rate of cell division in epithelial tissue is faster than other tissues. Again, the reason for that is our epithelial cells, you know, they're up against wear and tear all the time, right? So they're going to be, you know, damaged or sloughed off right? and we need to replace them. Okay, so let's take a look at the integrity of epithelia. Right? In, in order for epithelium to work, right, to be a really good barrier, remember we said that was one of the main functions, kind of like a protective barrier, it, the epithelium must be a complete covering or lining. Right? It needs to be a complete sheet that either covers or lines. Right? If we were to have a break in the epithelium, bacteria, let's say, can get into our skin and cause an infection. So there are three things that I'd like to go over for the remaining part of this lesson that um, maintain the integrity of epithelia. We'll take a look at intercellular connections, right? What holds epithelial cells together to form a sheet? Then we'll take a look at how the um, epithelium is attached to that basement membrane, right, so that the cells don't lift away. And then we'll just kind of review epithelial maintenance and repair. Just talk a little bit about, again, stem cells and how cells um, that are damaged or lost need to be um, replaced. Okay, so let's take a look at intercellular connections, right? Inter means between cellular means the cells, right? So between the cells, we have connections that are holding the cells together, right? So epithelial cells are attached to one another and to the basement membrane. Now, these intercellular connections are going to occur in two places. They're going to occur between two cell membranes. Let's just say my hand here is the cell membrane of one cell. Here's the cell membrane of another cell. These cell membranes are actually going to be connected together. And we'll take a look at what does that in a minute. And then there's also going to be specialized attachment sites known as cell junctions. Right. So we're going to take a look at the cell membranes opposing one another. And then we'll take a look at a couple different types of important um, cell junctions. So let's take a look at the plasma membrane 
uh, connections. All right. Large areas of the plasma membrane are connected together by something known as CAMs, cell adhesion molecules, right? We usually just call them CAMs. This is a special type of transmembrane protein that actually binds to each other and even into extracellular materials. So what does that mean? Let's take a look. I'm going to take you to a picture here for a second. Let me go. Let's go here. Watch this. So basically, we have a cell membrane here. Just ignore this for a second. Here's one cell membrane. Here's another cell membrane. Okay. So along the cell membrane, we're going to have these proteins. They're called transmembranous proteins. Uh, they're specifically called CAMs. These are a type of transmembranous protein. So I'm sorry about that. They're known as CAMs. They're a type of transmembranous protein. And you can see these proteins interlock, right? So the proteins from the cell here on the right are going to interlock with the cells on the left, okay? And right there. So CAM, CAMs, right? Transmembrane proteins, and they bind to each other from one cell membrane to the next. The other thing that's uh, in, in between the, the cell membranes that are being you know kind of connected together is what I call intercellular cement. I love using that terminology. These are a type of chemical known as proteoglycans. So if we were to go over here, again I'm just kind of go back to this one picture here. Right here this is not empty space between the cell membrane on the right and the cell membrane on the left. This is filled with, again, what I like to call intercellular cement. These are chemicals known as proteoglycan. Um, one of the uh, famous ones that you may hear about is known as hyaluronic acid. Uh, that's one type of uh, proteoglycan. Okay, so think of it as like a glue that's holding the cell membranes together. Right, so we have proteins called CAMs and this glue called intercellular cement. Now, the other thing that will help to hold cells together are specific types of cell junctions. Right? These uh, form bonds with other cells or even with the extracellular material. There are three specialized cell junctions that we're going to look at. We'll take a look at gap junctions tight junctions and then something called desmosomes and then hemidesmosomes which we can do or under desmosomes. So just look over here for one second. This is just kind of an overview showing the, the different types of um, uh, junctions. So basically here guys we just see like a cell membrane where my cursor is here, a cell membrane over here, right? and inside here would be our um, uh, that intracellular, intracellular cement, right? And then over here you can see there's some of these uh, CAMs, right? The CAMS, the cell adhesion molecules. But we're going to also look now in certain cells, we may have something called gap junctions as an additional thing. We'll have these things here called spot desmosomes. Down at the bottom we're going to have hemidesmosomes. And then up top here we're going to have something called tight junctions. Okay, so let's take a look at the gap junctions first. Now not all cells have gap junctions. We'll see that only certain types of cells have gap junctions. But what's important about it, this type of junction allows for communication between the cells. And the cells are actually going to be held together by interlocking transmembrane proteins, but we don't call them CAMs. They're actually a protein known as connexons. And these connexons have a central core. So Let's take a look over here. We have a cell membrane here on the left. Follow my cursor down. And then another cell membrane of another cell on the right. All right so these are two opposing cells. Here's the protein connecting one cell here to the other cell over here. Notice that protein has a central core like a tunnel. The name of this protein is connexon. So now different materials, ions, let's say, can transfer from here into this cell. Right? It allows for communication. Um, and that's necessary, we'll see, to control 
the uh, coordination of the heart muscle as you go into A and P2, you'll learn this. It coordinates the contraction of smooth muscle. It even coordinates the beating of cilia. Remember I said before when cilia have like a fluid or debris on it, they'll start to beat in unison? Well, it's these gap junctions that coordinate that movement of the cilia. Okay, so again, the protein that I'd like you to know is called connexons and it has a central core and it allows the movement of ions and substances through that core. Uh, heart muscle is a good example, smooth muscle and control the beating of cilia is another good example. Okay, this is from again another textbook just kind of showing again a cell membrane and a cell membrane and then you can see the gap junctions right here, all the connexons. Okay. The second type of um, specialized junction is known as a tight junction. Now, these are located at the top of the epithelial cells. So if you remember, the top of the epithelial cells were known as the apical region. And here we're going to see that the plasma membranes are held tightly together by many interlocking junctional proteins. So if you take a look here, let's say this is the uh, cell membrane on the left. Right, here's another cell membrane on the right of another cell. Um, and we'll just say this is the top of the cell. Look at all these proteins, just a whole row of them. Kind of reminds me of stitching, right? If you were going to do some sewing with a sewing machine, you just kind of run the garment through this, uh, the sewing machine, right? you get all this stitching. And what that's doing is that is tightly holding this cell membrane to this cell membrane. And then this way, nothing can leak between the cells. Right? And think about that. Um, where we have fluid in an organ. We wouldn't want the fluid enzymes or waste products to leak out of the organ between the cells. So one other thing, if you look right below, here's the tight junction up here, right below the tight junction, we do see this other thing known as an adhesion belt, right? This is kind of just this raised area right here. It kind of goes around the cell and the adhesion belt is tied to a bunch of uh, microfilaments known as the terminal web. Um, and that also helps to stabilize the um, tight junction. Okay, so the adhesion belt is located just inferior to the tight, tight junction and that adhesion belt further ties into these microfilaments known as the terminal web. So again, why are tight junctions important to us? These prevent the passage of water and solutes from between the cells. We don't want anything leaking out between the cells. An example of that again would be just different enzymes, waste products, acids um, that are inside the hollow part of an organ known as the lumen and we wouldn't want that to leak out. Right? We wouldn't want that to leak out. Okay, so those are tight junctions. Um, here's again another another textbook again just showing, they're not showing the adhesion belt on this one, but they're showing the cell membrane on the left, cell membrane on the right, and again all these are transmembrane proteins, this junctional interlocking proteins uh, again, just like I said, kind of reminds me of stitching. Right? If you kind of ran garment through a sewing machine, you know, just kind of running it through, you would get all the stitches. All right? So this is known as a tight junction. The last uh, specialized type of junction is known as a desmosome. Um, since most epithelial cells are subject to mechanical stress, remember their covering and their lining, they really have to have strong interconnections. And that's what allows us to, you know, to bend and to stretch without our skin ripping apart. So basically we're going to see our CAMs, which are the uh, cell adhesion molecules and the proteoglycans, that's the intercellular cement that are going to hold together our plasma membranes like we said before. But in addition, we're going to have something known as a desmosome. The desmosome, specifically a spot desmosome, is going to tie the cells together laterally. So what are we saying? This right here is a spot desmosome. Basically what we have is this dense area right here, a dense area right over here. Here's our CAMs. Inside here would be the 
intercellular cement, right, the proteoglycans. And this dense area is also tied into some of the cytoskeleton. These are intermediate filaments. Um, just as an example, you don't have to write this down, but one of the types of intermediate filaments that are inside our cell is known as keratin, right? You may have heard of that. Um, and by uh, tying this dense area to the keratin, right, which are strong fibers inside the cell, that helps to hold the two cell membranes together. Right? So this would be an example of a spot desmosome. Um, let's go back a minute. Let me just show you on that overview slide. So over here, guys, they're basically showing you um, here's a, a spot desmosome holding this cell membrane here to this cell membrane here. So it just kind of looks like a spot, like a spot weld. Right? Here's the spot desmosome. Here's the spot desmosome. Here's another one. Right? Just to kind of give you an idea. So they're just kind of, you know, it's uh, sporadically placed and holding the cells together. Okay, um, so here's that again, the whole spot desmosome. You're going to get, you're going to see the dense area, and that's going to be tied to the mi um, not microfilaments, but the uh, intermediate filaments this time. Uh, again, an example of this would be keratin. All right, here's the spot desmosome again from a different textbook. So this whole thing right here. And here's the dense area. They're calling it a plaque, but we're going to call it a dense area. Here's the um, intermediate filaments right over here. Okay, let's go back to the notes. So hemidesmosomes, they don't connect cells side to side. Instead, they're going to connect the cell down to the basement membrane. Right. So the main thing you want to know about that is they're going to attach the cells to the basement membrane. Right, these are called hemidesmosomes. Hemi means a half. Right? We're only going to see the top part of it at the base of the um, base of the cell. Let me see if I have a picture for you. So here, guys, we're seeing uh, all of this like deeper blue here, and this little bit of a lighter blue here. This is the basement membrane. All right, here's the cell membrane of the cell. Again, here's going to be like that um, dense area, but this time, watch this we're going to have proteins that go down like little spikes and they tie to different um, parts of the basement membrane and they anchor the cell down. Kind of reminds me if you were going camping and you pitched a tent, right? you would have the, the ropes coming off of your tent, right? you would have to hit the stake of the rope into the ground to keep your tent from flying away. Right? It, keeps, it keeps the tent down. So notice we're only seeing half of the uh, dense area, right? so they call this a hemi Desmosome, right? And its function is to attach the um, the cell to the basement membrane. Again, here's from the other book. Again, the, what they're calling the plaque, we're going to call the dense area. And again, here's the proteins anchoring down to the basement membrane. Okay. Um, just while we're talking about the basement membrane, I just want to show you there are two par parts to the basement membrane. Um, the upper part is known as the basal lamina. If I go back a minute. So this part right up here, this is the basal lamina here. This is actually produced by the epithelial cell. And before I go back to the notes, I'll just show you here. This one that's thicker, it has you know fibers and collagen in here is known as the reticular lamina. This is produced by connective tissue below. Right, so both of these, the basal lamina and the reticular lamina, form the basement membrane. Okay, so the basal lamina is closest to the epithelium. The reticular lamina is going to be the, the deeper one, and that's going to give us a, a lot of strength. There's collagen in there and that type of thing. Okay. So finally, the last part of, again, maintaining um, integrity of the epithelium is that, remember that the epithelium is uh, exposed, right? It's exposed to the outside world. It's lining hollow organs, and there's different chemicals and enzymes and abrasion. So these cells become damaged or they slough off. We need to replace them. And it's important for you to know that we have stem cells, right? They're, they're usually located near the basement membrane. and um, these are continually dividing in um, epithelial tissue, so we make new cells to replace the old ones that are damaged or the ones that have been sloughed off. So that concludes this lesson. In our next lesson, we'll take a look at the classification of our epithelium.